you go way back to that first expedition to 1992, where I was in India climbing a new route with a bunch of you know really serious alpinists, and I had a reveal there that was you know the DNA, which was I saw a lot of people like you just said in the developing world, in this case northern India, which just didn't have access to healthcare and they just were struggling to make ends meet. And you walk through New Delhi in the streets in 1992 and you see somebody's just not going to make it to sunset. And I'm like, oh, wow. And I'm so hung up on climbing a mountain in northern India. I mean, so like, what's up with us, like, really self absorbed, you know, mountaineers and climbers? And that's okay. Like, I still believe that if that's our passion, we should do that. Welcome to Season 12, Episode 3 of the Backcountry Podcast. I'm Adam Howard. Jordan Campbell's relationship with Backcountry Magazine spans more than two decades. He published his first story in the magazine about a ski expedition in eastern Tibet in 2002. Throughout the course of his career, Campbell has worked for some of the biggest names in the outdoor industry, including Jagged Edge, the North Face, and Marmot. During that time, he found himself increasingly drawn to humanitarian efforts around the globe, it was also during this time that I found myself chasing around the mountains of Chamonix and Norway, where we became great friends. In recent years, his focus has shifted away from working on behalf of brands into something much more profound. Campbell founded Ramrope Global, a documentary film and production company, to shine a light on humanitarian crises in places like Iraq, Africa, and Ukraine. He's currently working on a film about the war in Ukraine called Ukraine Under Fire. In this episode, Jordan reflects on his career in the outdoor industry and how it led him to dedicate his life to humanitarian causes in order to tell their story. We'd like to thank Gordini for sponsoring this episode in independent media. Gordini has been redefining the cold weather experience through outdoor gear and glove innovation for more than 66 years. Based in Vermont, family-run and independently owned, Gordini has focused on the same mission since its founding in 1956, to keep you outside longer. From introducing the first ever down and leather ski mittens to, this year, launching the industry's first dual-layer ski sock, innovation is always done in the spirit of problem-solving and progress. Gordini believes that the future is in all our hands and now our feet. See what drives their product and their passions at Gordini.com. All right, friends, let's get into it. We hope you enjoy this new episode. Jordan Campbell, Jordan de Telemark. Welcome to the Backcountry Podcast. Hey, it's great to be here, Adam. You're looking good. Likewise. So, gosh, when first we met, you were pitching a story to Backcountry Magazine not long after uh, we had acquired it in 2002 uh, about a trip to Tibet. With the Newcombs, with both Newcombs, yeah. No, it was Mark Newcomb and Carlos Bueller, and uh, then yes. Ace Cavalli was the liaison that invited me at the last second. I had three weeks to go, and like decide to go, and I wasn't in good shape. But that's how it all started. <laughs> it was fast and furious. Tell us about that trip. Oh, sure. It was a, a life changing trip. Um, you know, when I look back at it. Um, it had it shaped a lot of the things that are going on in my life today. Um, Ace Cavalli is and I have been friends for years. We were climbing together for years. We skied and did the San Juan Hut systems here in my backyard. Ace, the legendary and, photographer. Yeah, for those in your for audience, our younger yeah. listeners. Yeah, I mean, really, just a touchstone for for photography and just a big inspiration to me. And essentially, he said, "Look, there's." Um, he'd been working with Marmon, the outdoor apparel company and outdoor and equipment company. He said. We're going to Tibet and I want to invite you to go. And that's the good news. The bad news is we're leaving in three weeks. And I'd been like, okay. So I just made it happen. And all of a sudden I was, you know, in this like amazing expedition to do the first ascent and maybe a ski descent of Sepu Kongri, the sort of shrouded, mysterious mountain in Eastern Tibet. And it was co-led by Mark Newcomb, who was another legendary skier out of Jackson mm-hmm. Hole and Mountain Guide. And then Carlos Bueller, who at the time is certainly probably the finest alpinist in the world. And uh, and so, you know, and it's several other amazing climbers and skiers, including Frank Bacall and Kate, you know, so a lot of us were there. And it was just, you know, an amazing trip because we were there at, in Tibet and we were at the base camp for, you know, six weeks, I think. 
And while we were climbing the mountain, sure, we were working the mountain and we used skis and we all skied from about 6,500 meters. Um, Mark and Carlos, I went up on summit day with them, but actually I turned around. Um, long story, but, you know, I gave Carlos my water and snow pants and those two tapped out on, topped out rather on the summit. And then we all skied from high altitude, but the climb, we spent so much time at base camp and around the Tibetans and we learned a lot about this sort of, you know, what, what life was like for them and they had no access to healthcare. And if they got an infection out there on their foot or on their arm, they would probably just die if they didn't have, you know, a way to get to Lhasa. So it was really, it had a like, like a life affirming sort of experience for all of us. I can say that, you know, all of us on the expedition would have, would say the same thing. We really connected with the Tibetans. So I saw the lack of healthcare for them. And then I also saw that humanitarian challenge, but then I saw the Chinese occupation of Tibet, which was really rough at that point in time, especially in the early 2000s. So it shaped me to, to start getting into humanitarian work, even though I, it actually started my career with Marmot, you know? So it was like all these things were happening in that space of time. Were you still at Jagged Edge at that time? And, and at- remind the listeners what Jagged Edge was, and I know it's not entirely gone, but different than it was. Sure. Tell us about that. Because Jagged Edge was pretty groundbreaking. I mean, they were doing some interesting things in outdoor apparel. Absolutely. Um, Jagged Edge was started in the early 1990s by Margaret and Paula Quenemann. And, uh, and some people say their name Quenemann. That's how I say it. But they were you know, remarkable women um, that were twin sisters and started this, this company. And uh, by the late 1990s, I'd been working for the North Face as the expeditions manager and sponsoring expeditions. And I it was kind of the wild time of the, of the late 90s and before the acquisition of Vanity Fair above North Face. And so um, I was laid off from the North Face in a crazy day where 70 of us all just kind of walked out the door back in the day. And this is not, not a diss on them at all. It just was a rough, rough time. And, yeah. and um, but long and the short of it, I started working with, with Jagged Edge because I was starting to date Margaret. And so it was really exciting to, to transition from like a $300 million company to this $3 million company. And then we worked really hard on that for years and um and it was a real player in the industry i mean you had your big brands like you know the north face in patagonia and marmot and mountain hardware and then you had these kind of smaller brands like cloudvale and jagged edge and we were all sort of the up-and-comers and it's very hard to maintain that so yeah i think when i took the expedition to tibet i think i probably took some kind of a leave of absence from jagged edge and then i think much not much longer i wasn't working for jagged edge and uh so that was part of that journey. Uh, and uh, so that, uh, that's how it kind of all was back in the history books for some context for people. Right, right. And so not long after that, you kind of formalized your relationship with Marmot. Um, yes. It was a to- while though. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I got so committed to humanitarian work that I worked with the North Face and Pete Athens, the, one of the sort of cornerstones to certainly their Everest, you know, initiatives. And we put together an expedition to do a, a humanitarian expedition with all the athletes of the North Face to cure blindness in South uh, Solo Kumbu in Nepal and then climb a peak. And uh, that was 2005. And then the next year, I started my relationship with Marmon officially as our communications director. Was Dr. Jeff Taven involved with, with that effort at that time? Yes, absolutely. So that 2005 Site to Summit expedition was led by Pete Athens. I was sort of the expedition media manager and together Pete and I pretty much built that expedition. And then we were focusing the attention on working with Dr. Jeff Tabin and the Himalayan Cataract Project. And uh, so that's kind of how we started our, you know, our, our expedition really started by doing two in remote medical camps in the sort of Maoist controlled territories of, of Southern Solu Kumbu. And then after yeah. we finished that, we all flew up in a helicopter and landed near the base camp of Chalatsi, which is right next to Mount Everest. And then we spent nine or 10 days trying to climb a really difficult, complicated 6,500 meter peak. And uh, so it's this concept of like altruism and adventure together. So alpine climbing and, and humanitarian works with, yeah, absolutely Jeff Tabin at the center of the whole story. And then 
just a side note that the the documentary film that was produced was called Light of the Himalaya, and it was a film by Michael Brown. You know, it won a lot of awards. It was you know on Rush Dish Network, and it was narrated by like somebody from you know for Hollywood. I can't even remember now. So it's a, you know it was a really big initiative, and it was a, turned into a sixteen page feature and outside and written by Nick Heil. For, for me, it was like at that time, it was like a a moment where all my resources and skills were being used, like I was climbing and, you know, putting together media projects, working with journalists, and then, you know, just doing things that were really important to me spiritually and philosophically. And so slowly, you kind of got more involved with Marmot. And um, we, of course, worked together a lot when you were doing PR there, uh, got to go to Chamonix with you and and ski around there. And, and we've been great friends for years now, which, which is awesome. Yeah. Kind of makes me yeah. feel a little old, but I'll, I'll get over it. Well, get um, ready. It gets, gets worse. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you've always had this interest in global studies, third world countries where, you know, we're at this, this kind of intersection of arguably privileged Western climbers and skiers that are coming into these places, interacting with these impoverished communities, recognizing some of their needs. That clearly struck you. That's always been part of who you are. But increasingly you're you, you have to make a living, right? You gotta you gotta make a living. You work more closely on more of the traditional marketing and PR for Marmot from for quite a few years. And then in 2017, what happened? Because you went all in and, and we'll get yeah. to that in a minute. But why sure. transition? So many people love the outdoor industry and want to make that career, but but you got to a place where you're like, you know what, this I can do more. Right. What's it going to be? Right. Well, you're you're sort of asking like the million dollar question for for sort of almost my whole life. You know, like I mean, my biggest passions in the world have been mountaineering and climbing, and then humanitarian works. Right. So. If you just go way back, I mean, I first and foremost have had the most amazing outdoor industry career that I could have dreamt up for me, you know, for somebody else, they want to be a vice president for the North Face or they want to run, you know, Gore-Tex or they want to, you know, maybe it's, run, you know, owning an amazing magazine like you guys have done and, and you have done, Howie. I mean, so uh, the outdoor industry has been nothing but a godsend. It was like a storybook story for me. And I've been grateful for that. And the expeditions that I did with the North Face or Marmot were just small boat tea trips that I was able to pull off between jobs or yeah, you know, just the weekend warriorship of all of it from the climbing, the skiing, you know. So that's just to set that table. But if you go way back to that first expedition to 1992, where I was in India climbing a new route with a bunch of, you know, really serious alpinists. And I had, I, I had a reveal there that was, you know, the DNA, which was I saw a lot of people, like you just said, in the developing world, in this case, northern India, were just, it didn't have access to healthcare and they just were struggling to make ends meet. And you walk through New Delhi in the streets in 1992 and you see somebody's just not going to make it to sunset. And I'm like, oh, wow. And I'm so hung up on climbing a mountain in northern India. I mean, so like, what's up with us, like, really self absorbed, you know, mountaineers and climbers? And that's okay. Like, I, still believe that that if that's our passion we should do that but then you go to 10 years later well, the other thing is i got sick from that expedition from taking the drug i took this anti-malarial drug and was very sick with fatigue for years you know changed the course of my life 10 years later when i finally went back to tibet with like you know ace cavalli mark Newt, carlos bueller and all those guys i mean all of a sudden i'm on like i went from a really rough gritty old school expedition of the early 90s kind of the stuff out of an Ernest Hemingway novel, you know, to like a sponsored glitzy expedition by Marmot, Gore-Tex, and Powder Magazine. And that reveal was similar. It was like, well, now you're, now you're climbing in the Himalayas and you, you kind of got the holy grail. You got to be on a really amazing first ascent sponsored expedition with the best in class people. But, you know, I think my heart was always saying, you know, I really want to do more. And so I started doing more with that expedition with the North Face in 2005 to cure blindness. And I started following that journey. And I went to South Sudan in 2011 and did a very non-climber experience, just working with the same amazing carneal surgeon and cataract surgeon, Jeff Tabin, and 
a group of people that we did, you know, a week in South Sudan, another conflict zone, essentially. And somewhere in there, I was still like this, you know, executive with Marmot and, you know, working with the athletes and sponsoring trips and, you know, just doing everything that you would with any of those amazing brands. But my, you know, I remember my boss saying, this gets you my, on this timeline, it'll bring you up to about 2016, the year before I left Marmot. My boss said, Jordan, you know, you've got two, two months plus of unused accrued vacation. You need to start using it or you're going to lose it. So I, uh, I decided to, uh, you know, use that and I just went to Libya. And uh, it, as crazy as that sounds, I'd always been interested in Libya. And I'd heard about this international pediatric cardiac surgeon. And I said, why don't I, why don't I write an article for, for like National Geographic and try something really crazy? And so, yeah, I flew to Libya with the team and got in at special permission. And it was really complicated, super kinetic, very dangerous place. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's in the middle of a civil war and it, at the time, was still struggling with its own, you know, armed conflict with ISIS and Al, um, Al Ansara and all these other, you know, really serious terrorist organizations. So after that, I wrote a piece for National Geographic. And uh, in that same year, I went to Kosovo, which was another sort of not so hot, but a recovering, you know, post-war recovery zone. And uh, there's a lot going on. So it just got my head into a lot of international aspects between that, South Sudan and Libya. And the next year um, was the year I actually left Marmot. And I just said, I went all in. Yeah, I was like, yeah, I'm going to go back. And I went back and did another story. I thought same pediatric cardiac surgeon. And I went to Iraq and Ukraine with him. And I did my interview with him on the eighth floor of Hotel Ukraine router overlooking the Maidan Square in Ukraine after we'd been in Iraq for 10 days. What were some of your impressions of Ukraine? Because, you know, this is poignant at this time, obviously, because you've been back several times. But at that time, what what were some of your takeaways from that place? It's a great question because it was different. Um, my, my takeaway was that I saw a country that was really trying to get rid of this Russian Soviet Union hangover, which was intense corruption, and a country that was dying to get more integrated into the European Union and be part of a Western European sort of construct. Um, if you know the documentary film called Winter on Fire, that's when the sort of Maidan revolution took place in, in Ukraine. That's probably a great place for your listeners or anyone else that's, you know, wanting to know and, and understand Ukraine is watch that documentary because it really sets the table. It shows how they, the, the young generation just ousted this really corrupt pro-Russian um, president, Viktor Yanukovych, and they just got written. And they protested for, you know, weeks in the, in the square. I think it was like two months. And, you know, people died. It was a true bona fide revolution, like out of the storybooks that we would read, you know, of Eastern Europe back in 100 years ago. So I think it really, um, it was a really interesting time to be there because I could feel the tension in the air. It didn't feel like it had broken away from Russia. And Russia was holding on for dear life. They didn't want them to be part of, of, of Europe. Hey, they want to all that is the old motherland. So your interest was set at that time. Mm, and, and we always get attached to these places we go and we follow them in the news and, and that never goes away. So fast forward to 2022. Gosh, are we 18 months in now? So yeah, t February 2022, right? Russia rolls in. At what point were you like, I'm going back? Well, I'd been studying it since my first trip in 2017, and I knew I wanted to go back. I even tried to get like, I remember scraping around like some websites trying to figure out how could I go to Ukraine and report on the war. The, the, the invasion started in 2014. That's just to be clear for you know, your listeners. Sure, of course. So yeah. they invaded Crimea. They invaded the Donbass. And before this invasion of 2022, over 10,000 soldiers had been killed out there. I mean, it was a real war, but it was it had quelled down enough. I was trying to get. I thought, well, that'd be a great entry entry point for me as a, uh, an aspiring war photographer, filmmaker, journalist. So I looked at it, but you know, I just couldn't get to it. And then in the fall of 21, before it went, as you started to see the heat, things were heating up on the borders. Um, 
you know, on the Belarusian and Russian and Donbass border, there was just a lot of buildup of military buildup. And, and uh, I started calling these pretty interesting shadowy figures that were based in Kiev. And um, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> and they said, if you want to, if you want to get out here, it's happening, man. You know, these, this is going to happen. And so by early 2022, before the invasion really took hold, I was already applying for um, my permit as a journalist with the armed services, armed forces of Ukraine. And so right as the invasion started, I was wanting to go, but my mother had been sick with um, a cancer surgery. So I just felt like I needed to wait for at least a month with her and take care of that. And so I actually didn't arrive in Kiev until like March 22. So a month after about that time, I think I got there. Tell us about that trip. Sure. It was, it was totally surreal. You know, I've done so much rough and tumble travel through all these places, whether it's Lebanon, Libya, Iraq, or Colombia or whatever. But uh, the, this was just, it was, it was next level. And I didn't understand why it would be. And it was fundamentally that you have to remember that a, a month after the invasion started, over 13, 14 million people had been displaced. And so what does that look like? They were all rushing to the Polish border, like 6 million refugees were pouring across the predominantly the, the Polish border and the Romanian border. And so the, the, the borders were just like really filled with, you know, refugee tents and just aid groups and, you know, from soup to nuts, everyone was there. Um, from Doctors Without Borders, International Crisis Group, and, you know, all those types. And, you know, the World Food Kitchen was doing amazing things there. And then just small little little initiatives from, you know, families to everything, you know, to deal with that. So getting across the border, I had, you know, I, I was completely alone, no fixer, no handler. I was bringing my camera on my backpack. And uh, I had my small little suitcase with my body armor and my helmet which was compulsory, by the way, once you get you, I did get my press credentials, but you need to have that to go and get in to any of those places to, to, to have, you know, sort of carte blanche, if you want to say it, to, to just film randomly anything. You have to have your press credentials on your body armor and you have to have, um, you know, level four plates and you have to have helmets. So that's like, you know, that plus some heavy stuff was 50 pounds in one suitcase. And then I had another suitcase with gear and cold weather stuff. And then the camera with all the drives and cords and the whole enchilada. So just getting in and out of like train stations and buses and all of that was really challenging. I think I did 24 hours on a bus finally with about 30 women predominantly who were refugees coming back across after the first month to see if they could sneak back in and see their family somehow or go get belongings or try to really reassess what was happening. I... uh I, when I finally got off that bus in Kiev, I was totally strung out. I think I'd gotten, everyone was sick on the bus. I got sick, of course, you know. Um, there was just colds going around. I got COVID finally. That was how I got COVID. <laughs> and, uh, and so Kiev looked like so post-apocalyptic. You know, it was just like no one on the streets. And I got to this frozen apartment that this guy had set up for me. I was with, I was technically, it's important to shout out that I was embedded with, um, Global Outreach Doctors, which is a humanitarian aid group. And they were sort of the hosting me and said, you know, you can come, you can film what you want, but we want you to just do some, some media coverage of our work. They sort of, they, they got me a free ticket to Krakow and the rest was on me. And I just said, okay, well, I'll make it happen. So that's just how that went. But um, I ended up embedding with ambulances and going up to Bucha, Boryajanka, and Irpin, those recently liberated towns and small cities that were occupied by the Russians. And we were there right when Bucha and Borijanka was being like liberated. And we were going through the streets and you would see all the destru destruction. It was totally surreal. Um, yeah, we saw, I must have seen 30 incinerated, you know, Russian tanks on the sides of the roads as we drove up. And you know, blast holes right in the freeway of missile strikes that were made of, might have even been from the Ukrainians themselves to to stop the Russians invading. It was something out of like you know Mad Max. And then yeah, I saw dead people. I saw you know some really horrible things, and it just still gets to me. And then I the, during that same trip, and I was always in these ambulances. Just and we would go you know try to provide you know. In, in emergent service, like, okay, somebody's totally dehydrated or somebody's fingers had been shot off by a soldier at a checkpoint just to mess them up, you know, 
and he hadn't hadn't even seen a doctor and he hadn't even he'd have to just cut off his own fingers and then put bandages on it and he was getting infected so that was one example um we met a 92 year old woman who'd been in Boryajanka holed up and you know she'd just come out and she hadn't had enough water or food and we spent time with her so you know all these things just just trying to take care of the population where we could and um and then we'd come back to Kiev and we were doing these forays and then we did this hairball trip clear out to Kramatorsk which is like driving from Denver to Chicago. We had 14 hours on the road to get to the far eastern Donbass. You got to remember at that point, no one was sure if Russia could or could not invade the country. And so you're wondering, okay, they didn't do very well coming in from Belarus from the north. Maybe they're going to do this blitzkrieg across the east and come take over the better part of the Donbass and the Kramatorsk and those, those sort of outlying cities. And so we went out there and, you know, helped move a bunch of maybe 20 people that had been stranded out in the Slovyansk Kramatorsk corridor out of the Donbass. And just, they were evacuees. They were just getting out because the Russians were coming in and we drove them all the way back to Dnipro. But it was, it was the Wild West. I mean, there was very limited sort of infrastructure as a military, you know, war zone goes. You could sort of get through checkpoints and, They'd be like, okay, you guys look okay. Yeah, you can go rescue 20 people or 100 people, whatever you need to do. But they were looking for spies back then too. I mean, it was all very surreal. It still is. Mm -hmm. um, so I know I'm over-talking that answer. No, I mean, it's hard to know what questions to ask, right? Like getting this story, following your, your travails on Instagram as I do, you can't get the whole picture. And so I've been looking forward to hearing that level of detail. Um, so you're over there in March of 22, and how long were you there in total? I, I was there, I think, a month. I was there yeah. March through a good chunk of April. And you come back home. And then I came back home, and um, and I, you know, uh, I, I knew I was going to go back the minute I got there because there was just so much at stake, and I just saw the injustice of this whole thing, and it was it was just totally surreal. It'd be like being in, be like being out here in Telluride and. Ridgeway and seeing, you know, the territorial defense, like my friends, you know, my climbing and skiing, all of us would be like at checkpoints and we'd be like manning our own little villages and cities. And it's just, it, and it's just as modern as it is in the United States. So it's just, it's like kind of, like I said, this kind of surrealism going on. You kind of expect to see that. We see that in parts of the developing world in Africa or the Middle East or other co conflict zones. But I think I knew I needed to come back. And so uh, I came back again with Global Outreach Doctors in the summer and August of last year. And I embedded in a military hospital right outside of Donetsk. And that was a whole different experience. Um, I was inside the military space proper working with commanders and, you know, um, military doctors. And I was working with great people there that hosted me. And I was... But it was so hot. And, um, and I mean that literally and figuratively, uh, you know, it was hot from a war perspective. You're just outside the shelling. So you always heard the outgoing and the incoming. The whole area was so far east. You had that sense of like, there are Russian saboteurs in this region. And that doesn't feel like if you're in Kyiv, you feel the sort of national pride and you feel like you're in the belly of, of, of Ukraine. If you're out on the east, that's the fringe. That's the area that's been contested and that, that, uh, Russia would love to have you think is, you know, all these Ukrainians want back to the motherland, which is ridiculous, of course. But uh, so there's a lot of pro-Russia there. There's a lot of Russian saboteurs. But the, the big takeaway and probably the most PTSD I'd had at that point was coming back from that trip, seeing all of the, the explosive wounds and the soldiers and not just PTSD like I've been through a lot. It's just the sadness of seeing the war. It was so bleak. And so that was the second trip. and. Um, we did cut a little film for Global Outreach Doctors with this group out of Santa Fe named DocuFilms, who I'm working with now on my film. Is that film available? Yeah, you can go to ukraineunderfire.com and just check out the two-minute teaser. And I'm now working on a five-minute film that will essentially be an extended teaser, but almost a trailer, but kind of almost its own little destination, I hope, of its own. Hmm. Just to show, and I can tell you more about the film specifically in a minute. But, you know, the reason I, I came back from that trip and, you know, it took some time. I lectured a lot. I spoke about what my experiences were. 
Uh, I did a story for a magazine. I did, you know, I did a lot of things. I was trying to make a lot of noise and amplify and be a citizen journalist and really just let people know what, what I was experiencing, what I was seeing. And then I went to Washington, D.C. with my diplomatic advisor, who I work with for my own little company, Romro Global. And he's amazing. I mean, he got me and we got into the Senate and I went to a parliamentary security intelligence forum. And um, I'd actually gone down to Guatemala and, and signed a declaration at that parliamentary security intelligence forum. It's all diplomatic ambassador level stuff. And I was just like, well, maybe I can make, help shape policy and, and, and just talk about war crimes and injustice and talk about genocidal acts. And so that was kind of in the middle. I went to the, the, the Christmas party for the Ukraine house in Washington, DC. And just standing by the Christmas tree was the Ukrainian ambassador who's, um, Oksana Marakarova, I believe is her name, if I pronounced it properly. She's just standing with no one talking into her. And I thought, okay, I'm going to go right over and just introduce myself. We spoke for just a bit. And I just thought, you know, I, I just see so much. And I'd followed so much about Ukraine at that point that I thought, I'm just going to make a film about this because this is a moment in global history. And I have that sort of moment where I, I'm not like working for a big corporation or I'm not working for a big brand in the outdoor industry. And this makes sense to me. And I know it's going to be like a multiple year run, but it matters to me to make this film. And so that was the inflection point was Washington. And so that's last year. And then you you were there again, just really quite recently this summer. So really this I went summer, two then. more times. So more I times. went, I've been five times total to Ukraine. And the wow. third trip was spring of this year. And that was really like the that was great because I went without any attachment to any anybody else's agenda other than my own filming filmmaking agenda. And, uh, you know, I can tell you about the film, but I stumbled on many characters, but I had people I knew. And this is probably a cool side story, if it's it, just worth sharing briefly. But it's like when I was working at Marmot, uh, we had our Ukrainian distributors and they were good friends with the Russian distributor, for that matter, at the time. And we would see each other every six months at our international sales meeting. And I became really good friends with Irina Karagan and pa Pablo. And uh, these two were based in um, Dnipro and in Kiev, and just fantastic people. And so when the war started, I, I was texting with them all night long. I was so concerned about their safety. And I, I'm, I'm so glad I bring this up. Uh, because that was one of the main things I said, I need to go over and just sort of be there. I knew I was interested on the subject, but all of a sudden I've got friends who are telling me like, I'm like, are you going to leave? Are you going to stay? And Pablo couldn't leave. Um, Kar Irina had the choice to leave with her children. And she said, no, we're going to stay and fight. And I'm building Molotov cocktails in my basement. And when she said that to me, I was like, wow, I got to go. I, I can't believe I'm hearing this. These are, these are, this is like, and you know, Arena's climbed Everest. She's trying to do all the seven summits and she's an outdoor fun hog like all of us. You know, it's just a crazy story. And same with Pablo, who's probably a 513 climber and he was sponsored by Black Diamond at one point. I mean, these, there's just like us, you know, friends and industry people and just as nice and as cool and as easy going for that matter. And they're sitting there telling me they're going to build Molotov cocktails. So that was, that was that moment. I went and I said, well, I'm going to come back when I make this film and I'm going to, I want to film you guys and interview you about what your experience has been and what it's, what resilience is all about. So I, I spent some, I spent a lot of time in Kiev interviewing people, my friends, Arena, Pablo. Um, I interviewed two other pediatric cardiac cardiologists and anesthesiologists that I'd worked with in Lebanon. They were both from Kharkiv. And so it's been a really amazing project where originally this sort of was like just this rambling journalist, you know, going and interviewing friends and new voices and just raising consciousness through their voices. But I also stumbled on Olga Butko, who is now my leading lady in this documentary. And she is a remarkable human being. She is uh, a national television journalist for Rada TV. She's a former supermodel, and uh, I don't know what constitutes a supermodel. Maybe I would just say she's in a former elite universal international model then, and worked for years in the space. Um, she's very beautiful, but she's also just like a beautiful person, and she's just got a heart of gold, and she 
she works as this very high level journalist and um how I stumbled on her is not worth the time. It's just so complicated. But anyway, she she said, uh, you know, she really wanted to support me and my initiative. And as I started talking to her, we we really just started, you know, figuring out maybe we can work together on this project a little bit more. And I think, you know, she she introduced me to my my di- director of photography, who's Ukrainian, who's over there. So we started a, a, a relationship with you know her and creating her as a main character to help tell the story of what she's going through. Because she similarly had the chance to leave and she decided to stay. And she, she sleeps in the office there at Rada TV and that's their national net- network hub. And it'd be like working with a CNN journalist and they're all of a sudden having to spend the night there because there's too many missile strikes or the curfew's in place. Um, they sometimes will broadcast out in the parking garage be- for safety reasons. It's, it's totally surreal. So anyway, I'm just rambling a little bit. But then the other main character I stumbled on was Peter Fouché, who's a combat medic. And he's working the front lines um, in the Donbass. And I, I kind of had my feet on how to work out there. And I said, you know, I just got on this call with him and I said, can you let me embed with you? And uh, he, he gave me the green light. He had to work with his commander. I still had up-to-date press credentials. And... uh yeah, I went all the way out and I, we were right outside the Bakhmut. We were in the Bakhmut region for about, you know, 10 days, two weeks, something like that. And I embedded in the ambulances and I was up by the zero line with him and, uh, worked with them at a base. Um, we got shelled every day. I mean, stuff was coming in and hitting the ground right around us at times and not, not like, you know, 10 feet away, but, you know, throughout the whole township. And we were in Konstantinivka, uh, which is just outside of Bakhmut. So. At the time, I was hoping to get into Bakhmut. Bakhmut was being taken over by the Russians and they were shelling us. And this is like 10, 12 kilometers from us. And um, in fact, after I left, they ended up, they had three missile strikes hit the base where we were. And, and that went poorly for those who were there. But, you know, it's just been, and then I went to safe houses and it was, it was just like out of a crazy movie. But I was able to interview this combat medic, you know, and, and just get his story. And he's this kind of, broken hero but like he's been there for 18 months and he's from the uk and he's like cl- a classic example of that stewardship of people just trying to help fortify and build up the internal re- you know reserves in in ukraine and and he's literally doing snatch and grab work right now right off the front lines in the forest there so he's my other main character so between olga and peter fouché they're sort of the two railroad tracks they're going to carry the story of war crimes injustice and, you know, genocide and a lot of misinformation. What are we not hearing here in the West that we should be hearing from experience about the war? Because, you know, unfortunately, the right has a certain version and the left has a certain version. It's hard to know what's what's what, I think, for a lot of us. And, and also, we're just, we're not getting a lot of reliable reporting. It seems like one of my questions is also how how many Western journalists are on the ground there that you encountered? Um, well, I would say this. Um, let me answer that last sort of point or address that first is I don't think there are that many Western journalists right out on the front line area. There are a lot of humanitarian aid workers and there's a lot of journalists that will kind of parachute in. And, you know, I'm somewhat a version of that. But I'm, you know, ultimately really committed and, you know, for this long range goal we have is making a film. I think you're getting decent coverage um, from various networks. I think CNN's international coverage is excellent, actually. And I think they, they're, they're able to challenge that. I think there's a lot of great coverage from the Kiev Independent, the actual, um, they, they, they call out their own bad behavior really well. They're kind of the New York Times of, um, of Ukraine. But their um, own bad you know, behavior, meaning, meaning, yeah, some of the they yeah, they address they, their own corruption, own demons, and they're not afraid to talk about it. I don't think there's anyone in that staff that's over the age of thirty. I mean, it is a really shows you a lot about what Ukraine is all about. Um, I highly recommend that for your listeners and you, and to just scrub through Kiev Independent and just start liking that on on Instagram. It's great coverage. The broader question of like what what's accurate and what's really happening. I mean, the first thing I would tell somebody 
with my five trips to Ukraine and just heaps of energy in this space is it is a very complex fight and war. Um, there's It's completely reordered the international stage. Um, when it gets really murky and foggy um, with all this coverage and, you know, you see Crimea and Bakhmut and Zaporizhia power plant and the dam blowing up and all this stuff. And it's just overwhelming. So I really want to say I validate that for everyone who's going through that. I get the same way. I get to the point where I'm like, wow, I can't even keep track of this. It's a huge war. It's a huge swath of land. And it involves, you know, maritime fighting. It's trench warfare like the, the World War II. It's got drones now, which is the biggest threat I have when I'm out there is drones and you know, all my friends that are dealing with that every day. It's my biggest concern for them. So it's got this 21st century stuff. It's got this old hangover of, you know. Uh, so it's it's a big, murky, foggy place at times. And if it gets too complicated for anyone, they just need to remember one thing is all it's got to do to end is Russia just needs to leave this this country they've tried to invade and occupy. It's that simple. The war will come to an in- instant end. And, uh, and there will be war crimes prosecuted for decades. But it's that easy. So... When it gets super, you know, fog of war, that's just one big takeaway I would tell people. I think the other thing I've learned, and this is really one of the reasons I've worked really hard um, on this project, is the misinformation campaign that is so afoot and has been for over a century with Russia and the former Soviet Union is so robust, so successful. Their propaganda machine would have you think you know, Russia is this insane victim in this in this project. And and think that is the biggest misconception that has been, you know, um, the prevailing theme that Russia would like to stall have. And when in actual fact, if you just study the data points on this, it doesn't make any sense at all. Russia's, I mean, first of all, Ukraine has never invaded anything in Russia for them to justify this ever, period, full stop. Um, Russia and, you know, has a history of invading and occupying countries for like, you know, 50 years, 60 years. That's their playbook. They invade and occupy and manipulate those systems. And in fact, it was so successful, you know, uh, that, you know, it, it, it created a total hangover. And that's what you're dealing with now. Um, so think of 15 breakaway states after the f- collapse of the Soviet Union, and that'll just give you the data points. And they would love to think that NATO's an invading force. NATO's never invaded a country ever, except I guess they weren't tapped. Uh, I don't know how you would describe their role in Kosovo in 1997. Other than that, since 1948, NATO's never invaded and occupied anything. They are a defending force. And these countries that used to be part of the Soviet Union are so still scared of Russia that they are, they've joined that club and there's 31 member states. So again, the data points really shore up and sober up the arguments. But Russia's prevailing misinformation camp will have you think Ukrainians are stupid. They don't have culture. They'll have you think that they're a threat to their existence. All this is just, you know, you know stuff that Russia's been doing for a century. They've been trying to invade and occupy and, and own Ukraine for over 100 years. They uh, forced famine on them in the early 1920s, and they did it again in the 1930s. Um, you know, just all I would say is do do your due diligence and read up on it, and it will be very clear. So that's those are the big takeaways um, from my perspective that I'm I'm trying to focus in on. Sure, there's war crimes, and and you know, and one like you and I were talking about this a little bit too, like in in since the Soviet Union collapsed and. All these countries in Eastern Europe, in one form or another, have assimilated into the European space or the European Union, and in one form or another are, are shades of democracies, and they have free press. They have you know, elected officials. Look at Putin and, and Russia. They've had 30 years to integrate. They've done none of it. They have, they've made their own point. They have decided to be an international pariah. You know, Putin's been in power for 25 years. They're really no different than North Korea or Iran. But it's important that at least you know from where I am and why that yeah. I see the injustice of this and I see the, the way it's being sold and being advanced, you know. One last question on this. And, you know, we could talk for hours about this and hours and hours and hours. It's a silly question as I think about it, but where do you see this going? Is there any hope that 
that this ends in a in a positive way for the Ukrainians? And if so, what's the pathway to that? Well, right now, there's just obviously so much going on, Adam. I mean, you can see like, you know, Zelensky just spoke at the UN and made a very powerful speech. Um, it is the cornerstone conversation to the election next year in the United States. So there's a lot at stake here. Um, but where I see it's going, mm, combined with kind of where I hope it's going, and I actually think this could happen. Um, I see, I see sort of like a, a force multiplier of having taken effect. Maybe this is not the right term, but I, I think where first and foremost, um, the attempt to invade and occupy Ukraine has been such an abject failure on the part of Russia that you can't keep selling that to your own population forever. It's a failed war. It's bringing home kids in body bags endlessly. It's a terrible tr injustice for, for, for those moms and dads in Russia. Whether or not they you know, have a huge allegiance to Mother Russia or how they feel about it is maybe less important, but they're, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, you can't, you can't put lipstick on a really horrible war that's failing. Um, Russia is also currently on their back foot because the counteroffensive has actually worked to some large degree. Um, the international support for Ukraine while it may have moments where it seems like it's waning, the broader big topics are that, yeah, it is, it is, it's there. Um, there, the conversation's hot for sure, but the, the support is there. Eventually, I think that, uh, you know, Ukraine will be part of the European Union and eventually will be part of NATO. The big combination of is, you know, you've got Russia failing with a failing war. They're on their back foot. And then you have all these international sanctions simultaneously hitting you know, um, this, you know, the, the Russian Federation and Vladimir Putin. And so you see, you, you know, the ruble's been in free fall and you, you see what's going to happen is, you know, in 1991, the all of the Soviet Union collapsed in on, on itself. Chernobyl was a big part of that, by the way. And I was there, by the way. Um, and so once that starts, that sort of total effect starts to hit, um, I don't know how you keep it going if your best friends are North Korea and Iran. You know, I don't, I don't know how well this is going to go long term. It, and Putin will have you believe it's again, he's doing everything he can. He is all in. And, um, and I think the, the hope would be that maybe there's an internal coup d'etat or a palace coup of some court sorts, or we wait, have to wait till Putin becomes too old to run the war. Um, and he ultimately fails or is replaced. And, and you also have all this other evidence with the Wagner group and, you know, failing. And, and I think people are really skeptical on, you know, where this could go. There's no good answer for you, for Russia. That is for sure. And unfortunately for Ukraine, they have to endure this. And, uh, and they're fighting, um, a foe that we fought for, you know, really 75 years. If you keep, keep it to the current day and, they're paying the ultimate price for all of Western Europe and Eastern Europe. And I feel like that's where we really need to step in and continue to support that and, and at a fraction of the cost to any of our, you know, adventures in the Middle East. So, so, you know, if we're looking at 5% of our total defense budget to support Ukraine, and that's what it's been, to have Ukraine then disseminate and destroy and, you know, 50% of Russia's entire military. That's a winning ticket. That's a very cheap date for us. If you go down that path of foreign policy. And so, you know, so that's where the war for me is really important. I think in the film, I want to make it have an enduring impact with war crimes and the injustice. And so that when the film, either the film ends before the war or the war ends before the film's completed, they will have enduring themes so that people can get a sense of what's been at stake and what's at stake on the global stage for the enduring generations. I almost shudder to bring it back to skiing, but I will because, uh, you know, there's two pretty major factories in the Ukraine and in the Western part of the country. One for Razi, where the, at least they make a lot of Razi equipment uh, and one that it's like OEM for Fisher among others. And they had to shut down at the outbreak of the war because a lot of their workforce had to go fight 
And it's been hard to get good information about those factories. It certainly has affected, you know, ski supply and, and so on. I wonder if you've heard anything about that or like I say, it seems even a shame to bring it up, but it's certainly of interest on the ski side of of what we're doing here. Well, you know, I honestly don't have a line of sight on what's happening with outdoor brands in Ukraine. Um, I, 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 I kind of did with, with Irina, but you know, the, the war is so all in and omnipresent for everyone there that it's, it's, it's sort of a double-edged sword. I mean, you know, it, it, it's important for those brands to have success because the economy's had such a hit, you know, because of the war. So you want them to be wildly successful and overcome. And I, and my, my guess would be that there's been a lot of support from the international community to help support, you know, those companies doing their work. And, uh, so that would be my, my hunch on it. And, uh, but most people in one form or another are, are focusing in on how to get through this window and emerge with a business that's still intact, probably. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, there's even people that, that's, you know, there's, they're, they're trying to enjoy their life a little bit in the Western part of the country. You know, there's, there's some great mountains. I mean, Adam, if we were to go do another trip, like we did in Norway or the one in France, I mean, I would love to, to go there and do a trip and a story in back country because there's some great ski opportunities and, and the whole outdoor backcountry ski culture, it's all there. I didn't answer that very well. I know you were going to no, ask well, me that. You know, like I say, it's tough to even even ask that question but um but it is as you say it's 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 important right like keeping money coming in especially when it's money coming in from out of the country whether it's you know europe buying wheat or a lot of the world buying wheat or buying skis you know it's like helping the cause in some ways so it's not completely superfluous i guess um so jordan c coming full circle you know when i hear what is really a great part of your life story uh now you really cut your teeth accessing these places around the world through climbing, through skiing, through expeditions. Clearly that prepared you for for this kind of travel. Not exactly, but like the logistics involved in an expedition aren't entirely different than the logistics involved in going to a war zone. I mean, that must have given you the the kind of courage you needed to take something like this on and go for it essentially because so many of us are not i mean what you're doing is very rare well you know i could speak to that um in this sense that uh you're absolutely right that you know like international travel first of all this is very big international travel going to ukraine but all those places i've been to in the last i think i counted up 16 17 trips back to back in all these kinetic places you know like i'd said libya iraq lebanon colombia then ukraine I think that the risk taking component is huge. Um, like climbing on an expedition or just skiing some really scary big line here in the San Juans. Um, you have to make decisions all the way before you even leave the house, really, right? You know that, and especially with backcountry skiing, you know, you really have to study the snowpack. And then there's just this whole risk tolerance, risk assessment window that you go through in this internal dialogue. I am a little, you know, I'm pretty conservative, but then I have windows where I'm, I'm kind of, I don't say I ever throw caution to the wind, but, you know, with expeditions, you're sort of working a mountain that can kill you very easily, right? So you, you have to make these really impeccable decisions and you're going to have to live with them. You know, with your, a, a, a really big day in the backcountry in the San Juans, yeah, you got to make those decisions and you're going to live with them for that day. Um, if you make a bad decision on an expedition, you're going to have to live with it for maybe days and weeks. You might take down the whole trip. And, and of course, you know, there's, could, there's all these huge consequences of getting frostbitten or injured or killed or just, you know, all of that. The outdoor experience and, and some of the risks I took, I use the same sort of framework to come at like traveling into, say, Libya or Iraq or Lebanon, the southern part of Lebanon. And you sort of like go, okay, well, Let's look at what's the risk here and what's my tolerance and, and, and then what's my out, what's my off ramp? How do I escape some bad situation, all that? So I got kind of, I kind of had a nice little graduation, you know, um, of, of learning how to work in really hostile environments. And, uh, so to, 
to go to a war zone though, like Ukraine, you, there's a certain degree of like, it's a much bigger place. It's a lot more can kill you and, and, it, and it can come out of left field. But I think if I'm answering your question, it is that, yeah, absolutely. Being a bold mountain person or, you know, taking some significant risks along the path, whether it's expeditions or big days in the mountains here or hot trips with Joe Ryan of the San Juan hot system. I mean, you know, I've taken some big risks with Joe. Uh, you know, and other people and, and you learn like, okay, what was the outcome? Well, well that was a stupid thing we did. You, we've all had that day, you know? Um, and uh, the one thing I like about backcountry skiers versus climbers, and I'm one of both, you know, like climbers are these tortured, troubled souls and backcountry skiers are like really just a lot more easy going and a lot more, you know, you know, just more, they kind of go with the flow quite literally. Um, and so I think as I've gotten older, the alpine climbing has become less, you know, um, desirable. I mean, I can't remember the last time I slapped the side of the rock and went, you know, hee haw. It's always, that's when I'm going back under skiing. So, but both have these really big risks and we know the consequences are really significant. Jordan, how can people support your work? Well, thanks. You know, I, I really appreciate that question. I am, in the midst of trying to raise awareness and, and funding for my film project. Um, there is a website, ukraineunderfire.com, and people can just go check out the 2.5 minute teaser there, which you get to see Olga, the, the leading um, character in the film, and Peter Fouché. You'll see a little of me in there too as a sort of wandering lost journalist trying to report on this huge war. And some of the characters in the film. It's pretty heavy. It's PD, and that that's that's one thing they can do is check out that video and share it. Um, uh, they can follow me on Instagram. They can follow me on you know LinkedIn and social media stuff. So that's great. Um, we have a GoFundMe page. It's actually on the Ukraine Under Fire page. You just go to you know donate or contribute or learn more. Can't remember what the button is, but there is a way to you know contribute and be part of this. And I feel like. Um, Ukraine Under Fire is mm, a state of mind as much as it is a film. Um, it's, it's, it is technically a, a, a working title. We may end up going with it. We're not sure, but fundamentally that is, it says everything in that title pretty well. So that's how people can help and they can get involved. Uh, I'm going to be going back to Washington again in December and I'll be speaking at the Parliamentary Security Intelligence Forum. I'll be doing talks in Colorado and I might do some at like Neptune Mountaineering or, or which I've done for our trip to Norway and a trip to Tibet. But I, I think I might do something in, um, you know, Boulder and Denver. And, uh, so I, I just want to keep sort of the awareness, uh, and, and clear open mindedness that, that is required to study a war that's this conflict. And then again, that is. It's easy to say it's a war. It's really Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So it's important that we keep, you know, the messaging clear and that people understand what's really happened here because uh, it will get foggy and it will get politicized over the next year. And I'm pushing myself way out there. I realize that. And you know what? I'm okay with it. It's been probably like all these graduating things we do in life. And suddenly we're like, yeah, I'm actually going to be hopefully speaking in Washington at the U.S. Senate. And uh, if I do, I'll, I'll let you know. Well, well, Jordan, I thank you for your courage. You're an inspiration. And uh, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me, Howie. You're the man. Thank you for listening and subscribing to the Backcountry Podcast and for supporting independent media. The Backcountry Podcast is produced by Backcountry Magazine, an imprint of Height of Land Publications in Jeffersonville, Vermont. Backcountry's small but mighty staff works hard to bring you stories that are beautifully produced, thoughtfully edited, and thoroughly fact-checked. Betsy Monero is our editor-in-chief. Mike Horn is our podcast producer and engineer. Our music was composed by Alex Paul. Please consider supporting independent journalism by subscribing at backcountrymagazine.com. Use code PODCAST for 10% off your entire order. I'm Adam Howard. Thanks for listening. Until next time, we'll see you in the backcountry.